our series in the book of 2 Corinthians, and um, I trust that you've been gleaning good things from this uh, series, and I, I know I have. In preparation for uh, these sermons, uh, I'm convinced that I get more than most people do, just because you're just you're digging and you're contemplating and you're praying, and and I just I just love the richness of the Lord's Word. It's just so good, and it's so applicable to every circumstance that we face in life. And uh, so we can be so thankful for that, you know. Um, there's places, I guess, where we're not able to uh, preach the Word of God freely, and uh, we're, we just got to be thankful for the fact that we can, and that we can, we can, uh, we can gather together like this and, and hear the Word of the Lord. Amen. So when we look at the history uh, in 2 Corinthians, there's scattered references uh, after the, the book of 1 Corinthians was, was written um, that, that uh, things had changed uh, between Paul and the church in Corinth. Um, there, there had been some tough discussions in 1 Corinthians um, about different issues. And uh, there was some strained, I guess you could say, strained relationship there. Um, we see it in the book of First, Second Corinthians. We've talked about this already. How um, there was some turbulence mirrored in the letter itself, and and uh, it seemed to be that uh, it worsened when other uh, preachers had come into sec into Cor Corinth and and had been teaching, and they had been promoting some ideologies. Uh, in opposition to the scriptural teaching laid down uh, in the inception of the church. And uh, Paul, uh, he'd felt it so hard that he decided when he was in Ephesus to make a, what we don't know exactly how, how it all went down, but a painful trip uh, to Corinth. And uh, so the Corinthian church, like any church, um, but this church in particular had some difficult issues that needed to, to be worked through. And Paul had a very difficult job on his hands trying to address the different issues that God had commissioned him to address, um, regardless of how difficult it was. So, you know, we're coming to a, uh, a place in 2 Corinthians in chapter 6 here. I'm going to be uh, preaching on 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 18, and then the first verse of uh, chapter 7, which actually belongs in, in, in that whole book bunch of scriptures here. So that's what our text is going to be this morning. I'm going to be talking this morning about a, an issue that was present in the church in Corinth that uh, Paul really was prompted by the Holy Spirit to address. And, and that is the subject of uh, being unequally yoked. So that's the title of the sermon this morning, unequally yoked. And the city of Corinth uh, was a very pagan environment uh, many of the people that were getting saved uh, during the establishment of this church, um, they'd come out of uh, scenarios where they were worshiping idols and, uh, and their families and friends were, were steeped in these deep uh, pagan traditions. And, and many of them uh, were in families where they themselves had become believers or maybe they and another person had become believers. But there was a lot of problems arising um, in this in this scenario, and the problem was that uh, uh, some of the Christians that were getting saved and becoming part of the Corinthian church, they they continued to forge major life partnerships with unbelieving people who were not in the same place as them spiritually, and. Uh, these Corinthians were yoking themselves uh, with unbelievers in marriage, social life, business life, and other ways, and, and actually were tarnishing their testimonies for Christ in the process. And that's the, the real issue here. Um, the Apostle Paul found it necessary, under the direction of the Spirit, to speak to the Corinthians, Corinthians pardon me, about the issue. And we're going to be exploring this this morning. And uh, I'm just going to read the... Uh, the text in uh, chapter 6, and we'll, we'll touch on the first verse of chapter 7 later, but I'm going to read the text in one, in one reading, and then we'll break it down from there. So, it says, uh, starting with verse 14, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? 
Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So that's our text this morning. So Paul starts off um, by presenting an argument, I, I guess you might say, by uh, on the point of principle, instructing the believers that they should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, in the old world, um, before the invention of the steam engine and the internal combustion engine, um, you know, animals would be used by farmers in, uh, in plowing the fields and preparing the fields and doing work in the fields. And these animals would be connected together, usually in pairs, but there's teams of them sometimes, but in pairs by a yoke. A, a yoke would connect these uh, animals together to work the fields for the sake of bringing a good harvest into the storehouses of the farmer. So um, the whole purpose of yoking them together would be so that they could work the fields. So when Paul talks about being unequally yoked together, this principle actually comes from um, a law or, uh, in Deuteronomy. It actually comes from a law in Deuteronomy. God actually uh, saw the need for uh, mentioning this. Deuteronomy chapter 22.10 um, talks about uh, the prohibition of putting an ox and a donkey together in plowing uh, a field with a yoke between them. So these two animals it, it, were prohibited from being yoked together in the law of Moses. Now that's an interesting law. I mean, uh, the law of Moses often... Someone having a hard time hearing me? You guys? Okay, just you guys. There is a, a difference between these two animals. And, uh, you know, the law of Moses sometimes got very specific about, uh, about different regulations. And there was a reason with this. Um, if you think about an ox and a donkey, they're two completely different animals. And um, the two animals have different temperaments. Uh, they don't pull together equally. It, it may, they make a very poor partnership when it comes to plowing fields. So since an, an ox and a donkey are different species with unequal strength, disposition, and ability, in this law, God's teaching his children that plowing a field would be far more difficult than necessary, and uh, it would be frustrating for each of those animals to have to work side by side because they're so dissimilar. They wouldn't work together comfortably, cheerfully. Uh, there would be trouble. There would be trouble. There'd probably be carnage, as a matter of fact. Um, Thus, yoking them together for plowing a field or pulling a wagon, which would mean that the ox would overpower the much smaller, shorter donkey, and the donkey, his pace would be slower, and uh, it would reduce the potential for effectiveness in dealing with the heavy workload of pulling a heavy cart or, or plowing the field. There would be this unequal uh, distribution of workload, and one would be har having a hard time keeping up, and the other one would be slowed down. Um, in verse... 14, the Apostle Paul continues to point out to the Corinthian believers that once they've made a decision to follow Jesus, they need to be careful in what kind of partnerships they forge in everyday life. Now, verse 14 has often been applied to the principle that a Christian person should never marry a non-Christian person. And this is actually true because the values, goals, uh, and, and, and thoughts of the Christian are going to be substantially different than the values and goals of the non-believer. Now, in the cultural context, a person who worships an idol, uh, which in Paul's time meant uh, pagan worship activities ar around uh, surrounding rituals and that sort of thing in the Corinthian temples, uh, in our time it may be different. Maybe it's uh, 
people that have a different religion or maybe that religion is secular humanism or atheism or the worship of money or the worship of leisure activities. If a partnership is formed with opposite goals, there will be reduced effectiveness for the believer in doing the Lord's work. Now, in a relationship made under such circumstances, there inevitably are going to be conflicts. And those conflicts will come possibly over how to spend money, how to raise children, and what kind of leisure activities to pursue. Uh, everything from the kind of programs you watch on television to movies to, to uh, what you do on Friday night. Th those sort of things. There's conflicts. Um, there might be conflicts between those people. Um, but Paul's argument is much more than advising people not to be unequally yoked in marriage, but also in business relationships and other significant life partnerships. It really applies to any uh, environment where we let the world influence our thinking. So, Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, he says this, Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we're unequally yoked in partnerships with unbelievers, it's going to be more difficult for us to maintain our godly bearings in life where our partners will be tempting us to conform with other ideologies that are outside of God's will. So Paul goes on to say, For what fellowship does light have with darkness? Or what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Well, Belial, that's not a common term. In the Old Testament, the word Belial appears actually more than 20 times in the Old Testament. And interestingly, though, most of those, instance, those instances in the Old Testament, they don't refer to um, a specific being, uh, but they do include Satan. Um, but what the verses are saying uh, is that Satan, uh, they're not saying that Satan alone is Belial. Belial most commonly appears to be a spirit or a personification of evil through people. That's the most common usage of it. Uh, so it is, if one is the son of Belial, they are, are wicked uh, or lawless in their demeanor, having the same rebellious spirit as Satan. So it's a, it's a, a kinship in spirit with the same rebellious spirit as Satan is. Right? So as Christians, we are daughters and sons of our Heavenly Father. Uh, but those who do not belong to the Lord are, it says in the scriptures, are sons and daughters of the Father of lies, or sons and daughters of Belial, until they are reconciled to God and are set free from sin. Because our sin nature holds us captive. And this is why Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today. He sets us free from the spirit of Belial. And that is, uh, you know, the, the, the sinful nature is fallen. And it doesn't mean that fallen-natured people can't do good things. I'm just saying that there is a difference between us when we're born again in the Spirit and when we, uh, before we come to know the Lord. So this passage calls, in, in, in 2 Corinthians here, calls for a degree of separation in uh, the most intimate of relationships that a person pursues in, in living. Not just marriage, but other things. As, it, as it's written in 1 Corinthians uh, 1533 this principle is true um, do not be misled uh, bad company corrupts good character and, and this is why Paul says in verse 15 and 16 in verse 16 specifically what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols for we are the temple of the living God as God has said I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people okay so they're uh, there's a significant issue that we need to talk about here because some people are in a position where they can't change their circumstances, nor should they. There are some who say, well, what if I've already forged a partnership with someone who doesn't believe and, and or what if I have come to the nor, know the Lord and my partner has not? Now, I've heard this. My spouse is an unbeliever and I often struggle over differences with them. I remain committed to our, our marriage, hoping the Lord will bring my spouse to faith one day. In the meantime, what does the Bible teach about how I should approach my marriage? How do I live out my faith while honoring my marriage in light of what God is saying in this passage of Scripture here in 2 Corinthians? Living with an unbelieving spouse, if you're a believer, is 
is a significant challenge. No doubt about it. It often means you have to approach your marriage and, 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 and deal with the different goals driven by your faith and your, your spouse's um, indifference, maybe, to your faith. These challenges can be difficult and they can cause significant stress in a marriage in, in addition to the normal stresses that come into marriages, um, which are everyone knows that's been married long enough come from time to time, right? You, you're two different people. You, you have two different things and you have to work at it sometimes, right? Nevertheless, with a marriage where, where we, we, we get saved and we enter into a, a, a marriage, or sorry, we, we, we enter into being saved with a marriage that's already in, in, in play, um, that believer is called to live in union with their spouse despite their differences. Now, there are some conditions on that, but the good news is that God provides people, I believe this, God provides people living under these circumstances an extra measure of grace to live productive and luminous, not just, not just you know, barely scraping by, but to live productive and luminous uh, Christian lives. And, and where there is a challenge at hand, we have to remember who we're serving. Our God is an awesome God, and he reigns over heaven and earth. And our God, when we call upon him and we trust in him, we place our trust in him, he gives us the strength to flourish in whatever circumstances that we find ourselves in. When there is a challenge at hand, God can give you the strength supernaturally to live as a strong believer under such circumstances. So Paul tells the Corinthians, actually we're going to track back to 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 17, he tells us this. He says, you know, regarding marriage... And, and being in marriage with an unbeliever when you come... I mean, all these people in Corinth, right? A lot of them were coming to, uh, to Christ and their partners weren't. So there was this, this issue at hand, right? So we, we need to talk about this. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 17, To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you, you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you save your wife? Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever, and this is the key, in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I laid down in all of the churches. You see, when God called you out of darkness into his glorious light, he called you knowing exactly where you are and what, where you belong. And, and sometimes God calls us to ministry of ministering to an unbelieving spouse. I believe that with all my heart. Um, there, is, there is times where God calls people, and he, know, he I mean, he's sovereign. He knew before you even came to him, right, exactly what situation that you were coming to him in, and he knew that that situation would be something that uh, you could blossom in your Christian walk in. Um, so, so I want to encourage you today. You see, um, why should a Christian try to keep their marriage to a non-Christian together. Um, there's a Bible commentator named David Guzik, and I, he answers this question in context with the verses we're talking about here, saying, because God can be glorified in such a marriage, he may do a work through that believing spouse to draw the unbelieving spouse to Jesus Christ. And we can't tell how that work is going to unfold. Sometimes it seems absolutely hopeless. You know, some of the people that have come to Christ, the circumstances was dire. You look at it, you go, how in the world are they ever going to come to, to believe in Christ? This is impossible. And then the next thing you know it, something cracks the, the shell. And, and the Lord just bursts it open and that person becomes a believer. I mean, how do we know that? We don't. The Lord knows, but the Lord has called us to be light in the darkness wherever we are. Even if that darkness is in relationships that he's placed us in when we came into the body of Christ. So, because God can be glorified through such a marriage, he may do a work, a supernatural work through you. You are called to be luminous, to be a light in the darkness, sanctified in this context, 
Okay, it says that the, the unbelieving uh, husband will be sanctified by the wife and the, sancti and, the, and the unbelieving wife will be sanctified by her husband. Sanctified in this context does not mean that the unbelieving spouse is going to be saved just by being married to a Christian. That's not what it's talking about. Okay? What it simply means is that they're set apart for a special working in their lives by the Holy Spirit. That unbelieving spouse is in a special place being married to you. Those children in that relationship are in a special place being, being uh, mothered and fathered by you because you bear the light of Christ. The spirit of the living God lives within you. So they have this sanctifying virtue of being close to someone who is a Christian and, and, and that can be said of marital relationships and child-mother-father relationships as well. So then Paul teaches us that there is grace, I believe, uh, to live in in a, in, a, in a life in a way that's, uh, that's pleasing to the Lord. Um, for people who find themselves already in a union with someone who's not a believer, if you find yourself in the circumstances, I have a number of suggestions for you. I'm just going to list them off. Um, firstly, commit yourself to praying. Praying for God's word to penetrate your spouse's heart. Right? That God would use you as an instrument to, uh, to your spouse's understanding of God. That God would use you and facilitate uh, an understanding through you. Secondly, you know, be patient and, and show grace to your spouse in the same way that Christ showed patience and grace towards you before you believed. And, and thirdly, be the hands and feet of Christ in your marriage. Commit yourself uh, to holy living and commit yourself to serving your spouse out of love and respect for them and for God. And lastly, but not leastly, check your heart motives towards your spouse. Check your heart motives. Are you showing gentleness and respect to your spouse despite their differences in viewing the world? Um, remember, God is the one at work in and through you in your spouse. It's tempting to be judgmental, but you've got to refrain from being judgmental of your spouse's reasons for questioning the Bible or questioning your relationship with God. This is instructions that that you, you need to take home with you because I know it's not going to be easy but God has given you this ministry and anytime God gives us a ministry he has given it to us for a reason so just trust him put your faith in the Lord look to him for your strength and all this to say okay in our passage I'm going to move on now the fact that God gives specific people extraordinary strength to live and flourish in this circumstance does not mean that once we are a believer that we have open license to forge new partnerships with whoever we like. That's what this scripture is talking about. That's why Paul is saying this. The Lord knows that it is clearly more difficult for us to live cleanly and focused if we do this. Also, Paul is not suggesting that Christians never associate with unbelievers. It says in Scripture that if we didn't associate with unbelievers, we'd have to leave the world, right? And this principle that we're in is, is to be in the world, but not of the world. I, I liken it to like uh, being a ship in the water, right? We sail the seas of the, of, of the world. The, the, the world is like the water of the sea, and we're like a ship that's floating on the water, Um the water shouldn't be in the ship. That's what this is trying to say. The water shouldn't be in the ship. The, if the world is influencing us and we're allowing the water into the ship, it's clear that we're unequally yoked together and we need to, to stop. We need to step back. We need to take stock. We need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. We need to ask him to patch up the holes that are allowing the water in. And God will do that. So Paul has given the believers an argument not to unite with unbelievers in partnership on principle. But secondly, in verses 17 and 18 here, he gives us an argument not to forge partnerships with unbelievers on the, the principle of promise as well. So verses 17 and 18 of our text read this. Therefore, it says, Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So in these verses of our text here, God's encouraging his believing children to keep themselves from being defiled because of a promise that's been given. So here's where we come to a bit of a problem, and we're going to talk about this problem. 
the problem of interpreting here what God is trying to tell us in this passage of Scripture. Because like all Scriptures, okay, but we're not meant to extract for our own purposes what we see in the Bible. We're meant to look at what's in the Bible in the context which it was intended. And this particular scripture is very much a scripture that has been taken out of context and taken to a wrong conclusion and actually harmed people in the process. Um, this verse has been wrongly taken to mean that Christians should be separated from the world and that we should all almost move to a society and live in colonies, separating ourselves from all of the people that are outside of Christ in our society, uh, be not part of them, be separate from them, just move away from the, the mainstream society and isolate yourselves in colonies. We've seen this, haven't we? It's happened and it's still happening today. This is not what Paul is trying to say here. If we take that scripture and run with that just on the sole basis of that one verse, we're going to take it out of context. And that's what Paul isn't trying to say here. The New Testament pattern for this is that the power to live undefiled cannot be motivated. If we look at the New Testament as a whole, it cannot be motivated by a sense that we will not be accepted by God unless we do what is right. That's not what this is trying to say here. Okay? There has been a very large problem in the past where righteous living is pursued as a prerequisite for being accepted by God as a Christian. No, we are not good enough in God's sight to earn righteousness and a place in heaven by our own personal efforts. We can't do it. It's been tried before, and it does not work. And the scriptures in the Old Testament, in the law, teach us that we're sinners and we're unable to obey the law of God through our own devices. Our human righteousness, no matter how good we think we are in the outside, not good enough. Not good enough to be accepted by God. The scribes and the Pharisees of the Israelites in the time of Jesus and Paul, they, they, they were outwardly perfect, I would say. Paul says uh, outwardly perfect. Outwardly perfect when it came to obeying the law of Moses, the law of God. But they were not good enough to earn acceptance from the Father. Jesus actually told his disciples in Matthew 5.20, we remember this scripture, most of us have read this before, um, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. They were outwardly perfect, some of these guys. Unless your righteousness surpasses that. I, I can guarantee you that we don't have righteousness. There is no human being alive that can surpass the righteousness on the outward of the scribes and the Pharisees of that day. Not a chance. Paul himself, who was a Pharisee before he came to faith in Jesus, recognized this. He recognized that salvation could only come by faith in Jesus Christ as a gift of God. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast and say, I'm the one that's made myself good enough to be accepted in God's sight. That is not how it is. That's not how it is. So what Paul is saying in this passage of Scripture to the Corinthians sounds an awful lot like God is calling his children to purity as a prerequisite to being accepted by him, but that's not what he's saying. What he is saying is not at all contradictory to his other teachings. When a person has, you see, when a person has genuine faith in Jesus, God sets us free from sin. He sets us free. When, when Jesus Christ's blood covers our sins and God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees blamelessness, not because of our own works, but because Christ, the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God, took the place of the sinner on the cross, and therefore there is freedom in Jesus because of the work of Christ, because of the resurrected Christ, because of his shed blood and the atoning sacrifice for us. That is freedom. This regeneration comes when the Holy Spirit enters a being, changes us from the inside out. The love of God is lavished upon us. I love that word, lavished, during the moment when we come to salvation. 1 John 3 lays out clearly what Paul is saying in our text here in 2 Corinthians. It, it, it supports it. It's written in 1 John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is, for we shall see him as he is. All 
all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone sin who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. I'm going to continue a little bit here. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Wow. This is, this is what's blending into 2 Corinthians here, this thought. Okay, The scripture clearly teaches that righteous living flows from a connection that we have with the Holy Spirit of God. Keeping ourselves pure is what? It is a call to worship. It is the response of a heart of gratitude, of love, to an inward recognition of the grace and forgiveness of the righteous one. The righteousness that God seeks in his children is done out of love for him, as an act of worship. Therefore, Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commands. This is part of what God considers as pure religion in his sight, right? We've talked about this before. James 1.27 confirms with us that what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, and 18 is correct when James says, religion that our God, our Father God accepts as pure and faultless is this. It's twofold, right? To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And what is the second part of this? to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. God promises to bless those who keep themselves pure in obedience to his word. Out of love for him, he will be our father and we will be his sons and daughters. <laughs> and the first verse of chapter 7 in context actually brings to, to strength the last verses of chapter 6, and, and, and this is the clincher. It says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of a reverence for God. The key to holy living, my friends, is to live a clean life as an act of worship that God considers as holy to, to live as an act of worship to the Savior out of love and reverence for Him. This is where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That deep reverence and respect and awe that comes when we look upon the character and nature of God as revealed in His Word, as revealed to our hearts in the Spirit. That is what is good. It flows from a heart that has embraced true faith, not from a heart that is trying to earn acceptance from God by doing our own good works, but rather of a willing overflow of recognition of the goodness, kindness, love, and mercy that the Lord has had towards us. 1 John 4.19 tells us that true believers love God. Why? Because He first loved us. Powerful. God first loves us. We didn't call him. He called us. He called out to us first. He first loved us. When we humble ourselves before God and, and have come to recognize all that Jesus has done for us and all that was done as an act, as an act of love from the Father and, and realize that the Holy Spirit has given, been given to us to help us by living on the inside of us, this journey as a result is an earnest desire to please the Lord God in how we live and carry out our daily lives. And that is equals holiness. So then, we live like a boat that's sailing on these waters of the world. But in Christ, our hulls are sealed so that the waters do not get into us. The love of God is like the sealing compound that keeps the water out. If we're finding that the water of the world's sin, which comes from... Um, bad actions, bad attitudes, bad motives in approaching life, if that's seeping into us, there is a problem with our understanding of the love and grace of God that needs to be corrected. We need to ask the Lord to renew our first love, to renew our understanding of His great love for us and to come back to being protected by that love that He first loved us with. You see, churches 
all over the place are vulnerable to what I call the anti-love orthodoxy attack. That's a mouthful, eh? Anti-love orthodoxy attack. Okay? This is why Jesus said, he said in the Revelation, in Revelation 2, 1 to 7, to the church in Ephesus, he says, uh, he calls them to return to their first love. You see, if you look at that scripture in, in Revelation about his message to Ephesus, um, you know, because of God's great love for his church, they were made alive in Christ. And that new life was exhibited on the passion of gratitude. That passion for the Savior spilled over out of the individual into other people and out into the culture they inhabited as corrupt as it was. Now, Jesus commends the Ephesians. He says, your works are good. He recognizes their good and hard work. They tested teachers that came their way to see whether their professions were real. They endured hardship and they persevered without growing weary. But along the way, it seems that they had lost connection somewhat with the head in their understanding of who they were in the kingdom. They had lost their warmth and their zeal. The love for Christ began to wax cold. And when they be had this happen, they began to go through the motions of good works motivated not by the love of Christ, but by the works themselves. What was once a love relationship cooled into merely religious orthodoxy. Once this happened, the church began to be affected and penetrated by false teachings. False teachers came who pointed them in the wrong directions. Their passions for Jesus became little more than cold expressions of what they knew in their head. And that's why Jesus called them to return to their first love for him because they had allowed their passion for him to grow cold. Similarly, and Paul here uh, encourages the Corinthian believers in our passage today here to pursue righteousness but not the spirit of cold orthodoxy. Okay, we, We're called to be orthodox in that we're called to take the scriptures as they were intended to be taken word for word, but those scriptures were intended to do something in us, not just to be inside of our heads. They were in turn made so that we could understand the nature of God and love him and love others the way that he loved us. Challenges us in the 21st century, right? I don't think there's any churches out there that aren't subject to or in danger of a certain amount of false teaching or Hearts waxing cold because they just haven't stayed in connection with the Lord. Maybe we've allowed other things to get in the way of our prayer life or our meditation on the Word and, and prayer has become second saddle to all the busy activities that we have. Maybe we've allowed our work partnerships and the things of this world to sideline us and to take us to thinking more about the things around us in this world than we do about eternal things and about the state of being of the lost souls that are around us in our community. See, our first love is the love Christ give us for, gives us for God and that in turn affects how we love one another. We should be zealous for this truth. Zealous for love as written to us in Ephesians 4.15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. So Lord, help us, help us to have alignment in our hearts with your attitude. Holy Spirit, take away the dross as we're melted down by this world's troubles. Take away the dross and leave us pure in our hearts so that we can live shining like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. Lord, we will come out from among those who serve another master. Lord, the world is influenced by the spirit of Belial. But Lord, you have accepted us as your children and you have given us everything we need 
for life and for godliness in you. Lord, help us. Help us to be alert for our enemy prowls around and he's rent, trying to render us ineffective in our witness. God, would you cause Hillside Community Church this morning to be a place where people see freedom, where they understand how much they are loved by you and that that love would set people free from the bondage of the spirit of Belial that's out there in this world. Lord, that you'd shelter us, that you'd protect us, that you give us the strength to do the things that we ought to do to bring glory to your holy name. Lord, we pray for those that are bound by the chains of darkness that are in our peripheral circles, Lord God. We pray, God, that we would shine forth the light of Jesus. And Lord, that they would see the sweetness of the fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives as we present the word of life in both our attitudes, our actions, and the way that we carry ourselves in, in, in every, every way. Lord, we know that we're weak. We can't do this alone. Lord, we fall on our face all the time when we try to do it alone. So have mercy upon us, O oh God. Help us, Lord God, to be repentant and penitent in the areas where we need to be, Lord, and also to be fervent and zealous in the areas where we need to be, Lord. Lord, that this world would know that you are the Savior, that you are uh, working in your church, and that they would see us, Lord, and the love that we have for one another, and they would know that you are God, and that you are the one that, uh, that has created everything, and they would surrender their lives to you. We pray for a mighty harvest of souls in the coming months, God. In this place, we pray for a harvest of souls that would be unparalleled in the history of Hillside Community Church. Lord, and, the, and, and we pray that people would be discipled and set free in the name of Jesus, that our baptismal would be overflowing, God, that people would be rejoicing as they're set free from the chains of darkness and the hopelessness that's out there in the darkness of this world. And we thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have here to praise you and the opportunity we have to live for you. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for everybody that's here today. And we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.